be a semi-autonomous rover building autonomous capability as it goes for a 14 Earth day or one lunar day. The last one I'll kind of highlight and I can talk about the technical challenges and how we're planning to overcome them for climate change and agriculture, all of that is due to uh, space and space investment. Maybe not, not, a, not a very funny one, but uh, we have to talk about it. We're not going to collect the material, bring it back, and then sell it on Earth because the value, as I mentioned about in situ research utilization, is using it where you find it. Welcome back on the Space Info Podcast. Here, we talk about space and everything related to it. If you are passionate about space, astronomy, technology, and everything about it, you can join all our social platform at the Space Info Club or our website at www.spaceinfo.club, where tons of content and a community of experts are there waiting for you. This is the Space Info Club. Good morning, everyone. Today we have a very special guest here on the Space Info Club podcast, Joseph Kerrick is a program manager at Lunar Outpost Oceania, based in Melbourne, Australia. And he holds a master's degree in space resources and a bachelor's degree in petroleum engineering with a minor also in economics from the Colorado School of Mines. Well, Joseph worked as a reservoir and production engineer in the oil and gas industry for several years before transitioning to the space industry. During his master's studies, Joseph conducted research on mining water and regolith on the lunar surface. So maybe you are understanding the topic of today. And during his master's study, Joseph conducted research on mining water, as I said, and also regolith. So at Lunar Outpost, he played a vital role in various such advanced rover projects, such as NASA's Break the Ice Challenge. Currently, Joseph is a uh, spearheading the Hilo 2 Consortium's technical and project effort as technical director to develop an autonomous lunar excavator for the Australian Space Agency Tailbrazer program, which will be the country's first rover mission to the moon. And also Joseph leads the commercialization of the company's space robotic systems for use in extreme environments here on Earth, on our planet. So good morning, Joseph. Joseph, how are you? Good morning. Thank you very much for having me, Sebastian. I'm pretty excited to, to talk to you about what we've been up to. Me too, me too. So thanks for being here. And well, I would start with uh, uh, with something that the people are very curious about. I'm talking about the Trade Brazer program. And I would like to, to talk with you about the objectives of the mission and uh, the scope of it. Yeah, great place to start. So the <coughs> Australian Space Agency's Trailblazer mission is a, an initiative that fits under the Moon to Mars initiative. So there's a, a couple sort of key pillars within that initiative and the Trailblazer program is set to be Australia's first lunar rover. So overall, this is a partnership with NASA where NASA will supply the, the rocket um, and uh, the Eclipse lander. Um, we'll do the procurement for that and Australia through the Australian Space Agency uh, will supply the rover. So the mission objective is to go to the Lunar South Pole later this decade, hopefully around 2027 or 2028. Um, it will be a semi-autonomous rover building autonomous capability as it goes for a 14 Earth Day or one Lunar Day mission, where it will be collecting samples of regolith, analyzing it, looking for volatile contents uh, within the regolith, trying to understand the eclipse lander's impact on uh, natural and or implanted volatiles that may be present, and overall increasing our understanding of the lunar south pole, potential resources, and again, um, lander's effects on it. So this can really help inform future in-situ resource utilization or ISRU missions uh, for the Artemis program and, and uh, the global space community. Yeah, so um, ba basically, this, uh, well, a, a lot of people maybe are thinking about, okay, so we are going to the moon to uh, explore the, the, the surface and also the little layers that are uh, uh, below that surface. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you mentioned the South Pole, and which is, uh, let's say, becoming very crowded with uh, people and companies that uh, would like to, to reach that zone because uh, is the, let's say, uh, the, the very first one we are aiming to for also future human exploration. But uh, yeah, for, for what it may, may seem easy, uh, I think that there are a lot of technical challenges and also uh, innovation that uh, we can, uh, let's say, uh, 
take out from, from these challenges. Also, you mentioned the fact that uh, the rover will be uh, of, uh, of a semi-autonomous kind. Maybe uh, you'd like to clarify a little of uh, what do you mean with semi-autonomous? Yeah, uh, so I'll kind of work backwards there. It's uh, autonomy in these environments is extremely difficult. Uh, for starters, there's no GPS. So all of your localization uh, needs to be done on local sort of features. So you use your camera systems to identify objects. You know, it could be the terrain, the mountains in the background or local uh, say boulders or craters and use those to uh, identify its position in sort of space and or the lander is always a good fix sort of reference. Um, so that's either visual based, you have your wheel odometry and IMUs to measure sort of your, your acceleration and, and change of position as you start to move and you reconcile all that to again give you a hopefully accurate um, position uh, of, the, of the rover within uh, 3D space on the moon. And once you have solid position, you can start to do path planning and then it can autonomously sort of execute on a plan. Um, that becomes extremely important as we start to go into space, um, particularly because of the, the round trip speed of light. Um, when you're talking about the moon, it's about seven seconds um, between sending a command for the rover to receive the command and then sort of confirmation that it came back. When you're looking at Mars, it could be something like 20 minutes. So you really can't rely on an operator sort of line of sight just driving through the, the video stream. So you have to become reliant on autonomy. Um, as you start to get more and more complex tasks, and as you said, there's a lot of interest in the South Pole, so hopefully there'll be many rovers there soon, um, and you'll want them to sort of autonomously work together, particularly to uh, ensure that they aren't, um, you know, uh, uh, potentially damaging things like running into the lander, so it needs to be autonomously uh, identifying those and, and executing uh, prior to sort of the human response uh, kicking in. So our autonomy systems are looking at the path planning, you know, looking at, at actually executing drives, but also some of the excavation. You know, you mentioned some of the just technical challenges more broadly. What's really exciting about this mission is the excavation component. Um, this, uh, uh, later this year, Lunar Outpost is sending the first commercial rover to the moon. Um, but another first for this mission is really the, the space resources and excavation side of it. We haven't done autonomous uh, rover excavation on the moon before. So it's, it's a new element and that comes with a lot of challenges because every large sort of mining or excavation system on Earth is really um, gets the force that it needs from the weight of the vehicle itself. But when you're on the moon, your weight is immediately cut by one sixth due to the lower gravity and we're heavily constrained on the amount of mass that we can send. The Trailblazer rover is limited to 20 kilograms. So it's effectively about three kilograms on Earth, um, which means it's really hard to dig deep into the into the ground. So that's a, an added element. Um, the last one I'll kind of highlight and I could talk about the technical challenges and how we're planning to overcome them for, for a while. but. Being the lunar south pole means you have really extreme lighting conditions. Um, the, the moon is almost a perfect top, so it kind of spins around and, and the sun is just going around the horizon, never going above about 10 degrees above the horizon. So you're always in an extremely long shadow and sort of black or white visual scenario. So camera systems aren't really tuned to that sort of environment or cameras for Earth. So you need to do a lot of testing um, which we've been doing over the past year to sort of replicate that appropriate albedo, uh, which is the reflectance of the, the lunar surface um, in that extreme lighting condition. Yeah, indeed, uh, I think that, that uh, something that we could, uh, let's say, un underline uh, for the uh, difficulty and also, uh, again, under the semi-autonomous uh, aspect for, for the people who are listening, well, Think about the difficulty that uh, we are uh, we are experiences here exper experiencing here on Earth uh, while trying to build an uh, autonomous vehicle, autonomous car. Well, we have a lot of more uh, confidence, a lot of more uh, let's say resources. At, for example, GPS that we have uh, available here on the planet, but uh, it's not available for sure on uh, on the moon. And uh, by uh, by instance, uh, China is trying is uh, has said that uh, they will uh, try to put a constellation to to give reference to the instruments that they rover on the surface of the moon. So this just gives the the idea of the tremendous difficulty that uh, we have to face when trying to build uh, uh, such kind of system. So maybe also. Uh, uh, 
uh, the, the idea of collaborating with other companies and also uh, other agency uh, is uh, has to be considered so maybe uh, you'd like to tell us uh, if uh, your partnership we uh, in the introduction uh, we, we mentioned NASA so maybe you'd like to, to tell us a little more about uh, your partnerships and uh, collaboration yeah it's a great question um, you know we have a, a really good sort of saying within our consortium that if you If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, so this is, is very much a, a team effort um, within sort of the our consortium, which is called ELO2, which is the, the group that actually executing on some of this work, but even the collaboration with the Australian Space Agency to ensure this is successful, and then the broader collaboration with NASA. Um, there's sort of collaboration on, on really every level from sovereign to sovereign and then company to company. So let me take one step back before I explain all the partners. Sure. I've explained the, the Trailblazer mission, but let me explain sort of the program. So the Australian Space Agency's put together a two-stage program. So we actually just finished, um, as of pretty much today, uh, stage one, where there was two consortium competing to um, build the eventual rover, which the Australian public calls uh, Rover. There was a public vote, that's the, the name that they decided on. So we'll uh, the winner of stage two will be decided probably in the next month or so, and then we would move on um, to then build that rover, uh, rover, which will be the real one that goes up. So in stage two, um, our consortium is called ELO2, which stands for EPE and Lunar Outpost Oceania Consortium. So I work for Lunar Outpost Oceania. We are the technical leads, but our co-lead is EPE Oceania. They're a defense robotics company. They're based in Brisbane and we're based in Melbourne. But we also have uh, 19 other uh, consortium partners. So I'll, I'll run through the list pretty quick, but we have some industry partners in BHP, um, a, a mining company. Uh, we have Element Robotics, End of War Technologies, um, Sabre Astronautics, Titomic, uh, Vipac, let's see, and then uh, we have many university partners. Um, we have RMIT, University of Melbourne, University of Adelaide, Australian National University, Swinburne, Monash, University of Sydney, and their Australian Centre for Field Robotics Group, um, and Queensland University of Technology, University of Tasmania, and Edith Cohen University. And then our one U.S. partner is Colorado School of Mines. And then we have outreach partners um, and One Giant Leap uh, Foundation Australia and VSAC, which is the Victorian Space Science Education Center. So a lot of partners, but they all have sort of uh, specific um, roles within the consortium and all have complementary efforts. And we want to, through this, not just you know deliver Australia's first lunar rover and, and a successful mission. It's about building industry capability in Australia advancing research and advancing the uh, STEM education goals for the country, um, you know, generating that interest in young kids and, and older to show them that there are career pathways in this and generate sort of job avenues. So that's why we have such a, a wide range of, of partners there, um, again, from anything from education and outreach to uh, helping us manufacture the rover. Yeah, um, I really, uh, really like that the fact that you mentioned uh, a lot, of, a lot of partners. And one, one question that came to my mind while we were talking, uh, particularly uh, in the end when you said, "Okay, our common goal, uh, clearly, your common goal is uh, delivery Australia uh, a first lunar, uh, lunar rover." But uh, in my mind, I was thinking, "Okay, but." Uh, Since you mentioned such different kind of uh, uh, partners like uh, university and private companies and then agencies, uh, okay, uh, any, uh, everyone has a different role, but I think that uh, uh, even though the final goal is, uh, is a single, is, a, is a one, uh, I, I think that, uh, let's say, the uh, intermediate goal uh, can be different, so probably uh, every different uh, uh, stakeholder is driven by uh, different purposes, at least in the intermediate steps. So how is Well, is there any difference in approaching a different kind of uh, uh, partners in this kind of, of job? Yeah, I think what can kind of provide a little more context into the different sort of goals and mm -hmm. then the partners we chose is is I, the, the pillars that the Australian Space Agency has sort of outlined for Trailblazer more explicitly. So there's, there's the technical pillar, which is basically designing and delivering uh, the rover to, to the best of the capability. There's the programmatic, Uh, pillar, which is more your capability to do that. So that is really where the team comes in. Do you have the capacity to actually 
uh, design and then build and then run the mission in, uh, uh, with appropriate quality assurance and risk management sort of strategies. The other two are then um, commercialization. So they want to see that this technology uh, has dual use capability and is uh, impacting secondary tertiary markets and is not just a one-off. It's, it's essentially grant funding that it turns into R&D that enables um, commercialization of this technology uh, for the future to create sustainable businesses. Um, and then the last pillar is, uh, is on inspiration um, and industry impact. So that's where we want to, there's a bit of overlap there, build the industry, but also bring the country along with us um, and, and sort of inspire the nation and again, generate career pathways for uh, students. Um, in Australia and across the world. So those are the four sort of criteria upon which we're measured um, in stage one and are the key pillars sort of moving forward. So with those in mind, that's how we sort of went about designing our team. And some, some members are really sort of focused on say the commercialization pillar. Some are really focused on the outreach pillar and, and some sort of spread across all of them as technical lead at Lunar Outpost Oceania. We obviously are heading up the technical pillar, but really have our foot um, pretty heavily in, in all of them. So that's where those came in and, and then obviously the, the relationship we have with each of the partners uh, can be quite different just depending on sort of the goals that the consortium has and each individual uh, entity has. We very much try and sort of align uh, individual organization goals with the, with the consortium goals and, and overall the Australian Space Agency goals. Yeah, I think that uh, particularly the last one of uh, inspiring and also trying to spread STEM uh, education uh, among a uh, young generation is uh, the one which is uh, most fascinating me since uh, since is also the way the the, the reason why uh, the Space Info Club started, which is uh, spreading the STEM uh, education and also involving uh, the new generation, also people who are curious about space and would like to know more. So uh, and also thank you for being here today. Uh, because with uh, with this podcast, with this episode, we are trying also with uh, to contribute to this mission. But I would like to focus on the on the second goal, which is uh, the one of uh, sustainability, but under the uh, the point of view of the business. So in terms of uh, economical sustainability, and also under uh, let's say a wider uh, a, a wider uh, significance of the of the world. Uh, so how do you envision the sustainability and also the resource utilization but under the let's say environmental point of view let's say maybe some people would object to the to the fact that we are going to the moon just to uh, to shrink all the resources to uh, to be used for us and also how, how the the business itself can be sustainable Yeah, it's a great question and, and I like that you kind of split it into essentially business sustainability and then the environmental sustainability. So I'll start with the environmental side. I mean, what's what's so fascinating about, about space and, and how we can really provide value to Earth is this concept of in-situ resource utilization. So it's using the resources that you find wherever you go, where you are. So instead of bringing everything that we need, the oxygen, the water, the building materials, Uh, from Earth to the moon, um, using the regolith that exists there that's full of iron, uh, silicon for solar panels, aluminum for building structures, um, and then water, uh, hydrogen and oxygen for plant growth and uh, breathing and rocket fuel as well as um, drinking for the astronauts. Um, that sort of sustainability cycle is really inherent and, and really required um, for, for space because it's extremely difficult to get things off of Earth. So every added kilogram um, when you're going from Earth to, to the moon can add significant amounts of cost. So you want to minimize how much you're, you're bringing with you, which minimizes launch um, and creates a model that I think the International Space Station, as, as an example, um, is, is the, the epitome of sustainability. They have a water recovery system that's, I believe, 98% efficient. Uh, so they're, Waste is a resource. They're, they're literally only disposing of 2% after it's probably been through the cycle a hundred times. So that sort of um, compact, fully waste integration sustainability technology is being developed for space because again, it has to be. And I can see a future when you know we can drive the cost of those sort of systems down, make them more compact, and potentially those are systems that can be in every house, right? That was uh, government funded Uh, research that went to space that has amazing benefits to come back to Earth. And that's just one example. I think there's a lot of those sort of examples where our R&D and investment in space 
does bring tangible benefit back to Earth. Um, and ISRU is really the focus of this mission. We're trying to understand the resources there so we can better sort of plan in the future of how do we actually develop these? Where do we want to put our certain systems? What resources are um, there versus what sh which do we have to bring so we can build those technologies to drive that sustainability? And then on the, the commercial side, um, yeah, it's essentially directly a pillar uh, um, and criteria for trailblazers, the commercial viability. Um, you know, uh, governments generally across the world um, don't want to see their, you know, their funding, their grant funding, which is ultimately taxpayer dollars, um, turn into nothing, right? They want to be able to sort of provide some grant funding uh, for a particular purpose, but have that be enough sort of funding to drive sustainability in, in those businesses so they don't have to keep funding these programs. And that's really where the the sort of new space race is pivoting, which I think is, is really beneficial. In the past, it was just governments doing it. And governments are really good at doing something that's never been done before for the first time. You know, NASA and the Apollo program. I'm not sure a commercial company probably could have done that back in the 1960s. But now that they have, commercial companies have been able, like SpaceX for rockets, have been able to drop the cost by multiple orders of magnitude um, because they can sort of go a bit leaner and, and find economic use cases within those and that's what we're trying to do with the rovers here. Take that initial funding to build Australia's capability to build these rovers um, but spin those technologies off. You know for us uh, mining for example is a big focus. What we're building for space at the end of the day is an autonomous lunar excavator. Um, there's a lot of technologies there that um, are more advanced than what you would see in uh, terrestrial mining. So that's where partners like BHP come in, where we're looking at trying to find the applications of these technologies uh, in their actual mine sites to drive that sustainability. Yeah, I, I think that this last point is something that uh, uh, I think a few people consider. Uh, but be before going on, I'd like to, uh, to give a couple of details for, for the people who are listening. One is uh, you say that we, need, we would need a lot of propellant, for example, to bring uh, things that we want to use uh, over the moon, for example, from Earth. So basically just to give, uh, again, people an idea uh, to, to put something into orbit, uh, uh, which is, let's say, uh, which weights uh, uh, a, a certain amount of kilograms. Uh, the percentage of the payload is something like less than 10% of the overall mass of the launcher plus the payload varying uh, by uh, on the basis of the orbit you're considering and the further you go uh, the, the more propellant you need for the same amount uh, of, uh, of payload mass so just consider the terms of the percentages uh, which is very low compared to the whole amount of propellant so for sure uh, this kind of uh, uh, efficiency is uh, is needed and uh, if you if you don't know how much is 98% of uh, of the efficiency in uh, water transportation for example or in water generation uh, think about that uh, uh, our in-house uh, uh, supply of water for example can experience up to uh, 70 80 percent of inefficiency so uh, in some in some part of the world uh, you, you lose uh, 80 liters of water if you if you're willing to transport 100 so uh, the, the efficiency is very low if you think about the waste water that you are uh, on, on the line for example but Given these details, uh, just to better uh, put things in perspective, I I'd like to focus on the last thing you said, uh, which is uh, uh, t which seems to me uh, a very dynamical approach of both the government and the uh, and the industry uh, inside this uh, this new space economy. Well, uh, maybe a lot of people have, have always seen the government as a contributor to uh, space research, for example, uh, and when the governmental funding is uh, ended. Based Basically, the research ends. But what you, what you were saying, at least to my understanding, is the fact that uh, now the government uh, and the public agencies are uh, a sort of initiator of a process which has to be captured by the industry, who has the role of continuing this process, like a, uh, like like a sort of a fire, let's say. So the government is the uh, the igniter of the fire, but then it's. Uh, uh, it's the industry up to uh, continue the process. I don't know if this is correct. Yeah, yeah, I think you summarize it really well there. I think that's that's certainly a direction that NASA is going, and I see some of the other international space agencies going there, sort of setting the direction, setting the priorities, and providing some of that sort of initial funding to, to get it going. But in a lot of contracts nowadays, your ability to sort of commercialize the 
the technology that you're developing for the space agency is being baked into these contracts. So we've covered the Trailblazer one pretty well, but another one, for example, that Lunar Outpost as lead of the Lunar Dawn team recently won a contract to design um, NASA's Lunar Terrain Vehicle. So this will be a large truck-sized vehicle that the, the Artemis astronauts will be driving. Um, and there's sort of commercialization baked into those contracts too. And again, that's the same model of NASA saying, this is what we want, here's some funding, but commercial industry, you go um, build it and, and try and get those, those costs down ultimately is what that enables. Yeah, I, I think that uh, we have uh, uh, experienced this, uh, uh, this new approach of NASA also in the last few days uh, because everyone is uh, basically is talking about uh, Boeing Starliner and uh, the comparison with uh, the Dragon SpaceX. Uh, the SpaceX Crew Dragon is uh, inevitable, I think, and uh, both, uh, both the companies uh, have uh, uh, joined the commercial crew uh, program by NASA with the same, uh, uh, let's say, business approach, which is uh, a cost fixed uh, approach so NASA said okay I give you this amount of money and uh, you have to build your own uh, capsule and make it work with only this money without uh, additional funding and uh, well uh, I, I would like to see uh, I would like to talk about a little uh, what, what about uh, what, what happens when things don't go as planned so how how risk has managed and also there are some mitigation strategies uh, under this perspective. Okay, I've taken into account, uh, uh, let's say, a, a very, a very well-known example. Maybe this is quite bigger than uh, the the picture we are looking at uh, today. But I think this makes the idea. Yeah, uh, risk management is a is an excellent topic, and it, it's a really broad one, right? Because we can talk about risk from a, a technical perspective, obviously, like what happens if the rover breaks or there's something that goes wrong in the mission, but there's also, you know, programmatic things. Um, what happens if uh, a, a business can no longer support um, and or uh, funding stops, you know, there's schedule costs, all those sort of uh, risks, and that's something that we really considered when, say, building the team. You want complementary efforts, but you want some level of overlap, uh, so you kind of have redundancy in, in certain systems um, and uh, capabilities. So there's those sort of risk management techniques and, and strategies. But to highlight maybe the technical ones, um, you know what, we, we like to test like we fly is kind of the common saying in, in the space industry and one that Lunar Outpost and the ELO2 consortium really lives by. So we, we do a lot of prototyping. In stage one, um, the Australian Space Agency uh, tasked us with delivering a preliminary design of uh, rover. Um, but instead of just sort of doing some analysis and some design, we really wanted to test those things, right? Because you, you can do as much analysis as you want on paper, but until you actually build the thing and try it, you can't know for certain if something's going to work and or what isn't going to work. So over the course of the past nearly 15 months, in stage one, we built four prototype rovers, um, each with a specific sort of testing purpose to test things like the low gravity. How can we excavate in this low gravity since no one's done it before? So we built a one-sixth gravity offload model um, or one-sixth mass offload model uh, to replicate as close as we can the forces that you would actually experience um, while on the moon and ensure that we can generate enough traction and have enough stability in our, our um, mobility systems. Uh, we built, we had a separate autonomy prototype just to be testing software um, so that we could do that in parallel while working on other things. We had a chassis and suspension model, which is our, our first one um, that helped us sort of put together um, a mechanical representation and mobility and suspension representation of what this thing is going to actually look like and start to sort of uh, figure out ways to cut down mass because again, we're pretty heavily constrained on how much we can bring. And each of those sort of specific testing goals um, really then fed into the, the overall prototype, which we call just our consortium prototype, which is a, a more representative um, example of what uh, our eventual flight design uh, will look like as it had representative perception systems, software, electrical, uh, mechanical, mobility, uh, excavation, communications subsystems. So we're able to then uh, simulate um, mission conops. So we actually, you know, we would stay up late at night, so we'd have a dark um, environment, put in an extreme lighting sort of light bulb to simulate the sun, build craters all around this um, regular simulate sand pits, and then uh, actually test driving the rover without seeing it. So only operating through the cameras um, and figuring and, and sort of confirming some of our assumptions or, or figuring out which assumptions are wrong 
and the testing technologies. Um, and that's been a, a, a really the best mitigation strategy that you, you can do is just try it and see what works and doesn't. Um, and that then, it's a, a very iterative process and forms the next sort of level of design. So we're constantly sort of evolving the design and, and getting confidence in it as we test those things. So that's our primary mitigation strategy. And I could talk for an hour and all the different tests that we did. Um, but it's it's really exciting because there's, as I said, there's, there's a lot of layers to the risk management. That's just, does this technology work? Does it not? Does this architecture work? But there's also things like the supply chain. Can we get these components in the time that we need? Can we manufacture them to the quality that we need? All of that is also starting to be mitigated just by building things and, and testing them. Um, and can the consortium work together? You know, typically these sort of things may not have as, as many partners. So it's there's there's advantages to doing having a vertically integrated company like SpaceX and doing it all internal. But there's also advantages to having many partners. Um, but the, the added challenge with that is all the interfaces that you need between organizations. So again, by trying to build something, we started to establish those interfaces between them. So risk management is really at the core of everything we've been doing for this mission. Um, it's, as I said, is, is Australia's first lunar rover, and we certainly don't want to see it fail. For sure. <laughs> And yeah, I think that you you depicted a quite quite a very clear picture. And if there is something that uh, uh, I would like to, to look from a, a different perspective, is uh, is uh, that it seems to me that we have talked uh, technically so far. So okay, logi from the logistic point of view, from the technical point of view, so the design, the integration. But uh, at the end of your, of your synthesis, you were talking about uh, uh, interfacing, interfacing with uh, different uh, uh, companies, agencies, and, uh, and things like that. I think that uh, uh, as it happens in, uh, in other uh, fields of the industry, when you are interfaces, interfacing with uh, different businesses, you also need uh, some kind of regulation. Uh, to correctly interface uh, and maybe uh, you you have to make sure that everyone is uh, let's say respecting the contract or is behaving as uh, as defining at the, at the beginning so uh, i would like to to go a little deeper into the regulatory environment and then i, I will ask you also uh, about the ethics but uh, this is a secondary question at the moment yeah regulatory sort of considerations are um are an interesting topic um, and, and, a, and a hot topic. Maybe not, not, a, not a very funny one, but uh, <laughs> we have to talk about it. No, it's important. Um, it's important to ensure that um, you know we're, we're going about things the right way. Um, and it's, as I said, sort of a, a hot topic because it probably depends on who you ask and, and, and in which country you ask and what the rules are. You know, to, to speak for the U.S., there was a, a Space Resource Exploration and Utilization Act, I believe it's called, in, in 2015, that um, you know, enables U.S. entities to engage in commercial space resource extraction activities. So that's you know, the possession, um, ownership, transport, use, and sale of those resources. Um, but there's a couple different sort of acts. There's the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. That's a, a little less clear on what you're allowed to do and, and not do. You know, overall, you're not allowed to, you know, um, uh, have national appropriation or, or claim of sovereignty of areas. So it's, you know, if, if a commercial company starts to mine something, is that a claim of national sovereignty? That's kind of the questions going out there. I think probably no. Um, it's it's one thing for a country to come in and say, we own the moon. I think generally what the Outer Space Treaty is trying to say is you can't do that. And most countries uh, have signed on to that and agreed. It's a little less clear. And again, they developed this in 1967, so perhaps they didn't have the full vision of what this is sort of now and what we are now envisioning it to be five, 10, 50 years from now. Um, I think a, a lot of countries are getting on board with you. You are allowed to have uh, or, or conduct space resource extraction activities um, and do so generally for the, the betterment of, of humanity. Um, to actually progress that Lunar Outpost's first uh, lunar voyage which will uh, launch in, in a matter of months, we'll be conducting the first sale of space resources to NASA. So collecting a, a, a very small um, sample, nothing sort of um, that will be really utilized, it's, it's more to establish the procedural and legal frameworks for how do you actually conduct a sale, right? Because you have to consider 
we're not going to collect the material, bring it back, and then sell it on Earth. Because the value, as I mentioned with in-situ research civilization, is using it where you find it. So it's, it's doing the sale on the moon doing an in-place sort of transfer of, of ownership so that the idea of that is is we want to just advance that regulatory uh, framework and, and considerations with starting with the basically a trivial amount of, of regoliths so that when we um, go back with with larger systems and want to actually start say building habitats for the astronauts and using the regolith there we're not being um, held up by those regulatory frameworks and, and who owns this sort of piece of, of regolith dirt um, and, and we've already kind of figured that out. So it's, there's definitely a lot to kind of be said and there's whole degrees really just on space resources, law and policy on, on how that works, but it's, it's a pretty interesting uh, consideration. Yeah, also for the fact that uh, space law is uh, uh, luckily becoming a, a more and more popular uh, topic these days. So a lot of people are also trying to uh, take care of this aspect. And I say luckily because uh, We've been used to the fact that uh, usually law comes after uh, the, the technical aspect, for example, or the operational aspect. So uh, American went to the moon uh, and then uh, the, the space law developed around that fact, for example, just to make a, a, an example. So also this fact may introduce us to talk about the ethical consideration. We, uh, you mentioned a lot of uh, uh, very interesting Uh, I think very uh, practical example on uh, how the technology development uh, will help us in the future and I think this is uh, uh, at least for me one of the starting points uh, to talk about uh, ethics of doing uh, uh, space exploration in particular lunar exploration so I, I don't know what's your view uh, about this topic yeah I mean the ethical considerations of it are, are also an interesting topic I mean I'm obviously very um on board with it and, and think that it is, it is a very ethical thing to do. Um, you know, and, and those that don't, I would encourage to kind of look past the um, the immediate step of say, putting a rover on the moon. Like what, what does that really mean in subsequent steps? And see how that value is actually brought back to the individual and really society on earth. You know, I think just about every space technology, there's traceability from the investment in that space activity to benefit back on earth. NASA actually has a really awesome website. Um, I'm trying to think of the name, but it's it's something on um, space technology for the benefit of Earth. NASA. I think if you Google that, you might be able to find their website. But it shows all their different programs and how it's benefiting. You know, something like the X-ray that was developed by his, uh, a physicist, astrophysicist, trying to investigate space, and how obviously we use X-rays all the time, and, and no one really considers that that was a space R&D. Most of the technology and phones. Um, GPS, everything we really know about climate change and agriculture, all of that is due to um, space and space investment. And when you start to be able to access resources um, in space and establish you know, a literal lunar outpost or, or actual um, systems in space, you're driving the cost of all of those things down even further. Our ability to you know, monitor climate change, if we're able to build satellites in space, that's a significantly cheaper cost um, in the long run than building them in Earth and launching them from Earth, because then you're also reliant on the, the launch vehicles. So when you really kind of take a holistic view, even though that activity is being done in space, the benefit is, is still being sought uh, or seen on Earth. Um, And you know, I think there's there's some AI generated or, or artist renditions of what the moon would look like if we start mining it. And I can generally say most of those are wrong. If you're imagining looking up at the sky uh, just with your naked eye and seeing a massive mine on the moon, that's not what it's going to look like. Um, there's there's a lot of asteroids out there as well that provide a, a lot of excellent um, resources and, and you know most of what I've talked about is using those resources in place but once you've sort of established the infrastructure in space um, there's potential uh, in, in the future to bring some of those critical resources back to earth uh, things like platinum group metals or, or helium-3 things that are more rare on earth that are in extremely low concentrations where we do have to mine massive amounts of, of earth material on earth just to access a, a tiny bit of this you know say rare platinum group metal uh, where that may be abundant on, in, on an asteroid in space. So um, longer term, we can basically reduce the amount of mining on Earth and thus uh, environmental impact on Earth by building those things in space. And, and the last thing I'll say, 
with regards to that is, I think Jeff Bezos and, uh, has a really good quote with regards to Amazon. Amazon, it was only possible because uh, the U.S. government's uh, investment in the highway system, in the infrastructure. When the government invested in building this highway network, they weren't building it for something like Amazon. Amazon um, just happened to be a, one of now, you know, one of the largest companies in the world, most successful companies in the world that was sort of a, an afterthought due to that investment. By building an infrastructure in space, we're essentially building a highway network, and who knows what, can, what sort of benefits can come after that. Yeah, I think that this is a very, very clear example of, uh, of the uh, development, the future development, uh, and also how we can look uh, at the future. But uh, uh, it seems that, uh, well, me, me, me first, I'm very curious about, okay, let's try to make this future uh, a little closer to us. So maybe you'd like to tell us a little more about uh, the, the, next time, the, the next timeline and the, maybe a, a roadmap if... Uh, if it's available or shareable with us of, uh, of your project. Okay, I, I have understood that at the beginning you said you're at the very end of step one, of phase one and you are waiting for next month for phase two, but what's, what's next? Yeah, great question. So I'll start with sort of Lunar Outpost as a whole. As, as I mentioned, our, our company's first mission is actually flying in a couple months. So it'll be the first commercial rover to the Lunar South Pole. And I think that will really mark sort of the domino effect of missions to the moon um, and then we have we essentially have a cadence of a mission every year after that so then we'll have a our second mission uh, in 2025 going to an equatorial region called Ryan Gamma doing some science for NASA there we then have a, a third mission in late 2025 um, with another international space agency and then the, the trailblazer mission if we're successful we would launch again around 2027 so for trailblazers specifically um, Yes, I, uh, we're at the end of stage one. Stage two uh, would be kicked off later this year in about two to three months and would last about three years to um, finish the design, build, test, uh, and then actually run the mission. Uh, and that then really kicks off sort of the space resources utilization and, and ISRU side of things for the moon, uh, which is also really exciting. Um, and then there's you know plenty of missions sort of being filtered in throughout there from, from other agencies. Um, internationally and, and other commercial entities um, and I think from that the, the most valuable thing we're getting in these first couple of missions is the data right we're not sending the, the material back um, it's, it's the data to inform these future missions that then start to bring the astronauts where do we want to send the astronauts um, and then start to actually extract say the, the oxygen that they're going to breathe Uh, rather than bringing that with them. So then that's kind of, as I see, phase two um, with the Artemis program. They're gearing up to, to be able to send those astronauts pretty soon. Um, and the, the first missions may be on the order of days to weeks, but then the, the subsequent missions, they may be able to start to stay for months, potentially years, and the ultimate goal is, is indefinitely. Um, but we need these rover missions first to uh, basically ensure that we can supply things like, again, the, the oxygen. Um, and then that's where those larger vehicles like the lunar train vehicle will also start to come into play to move uh, cargo across the moon, move astronauts across the moon and, and conduct much larger range, longer time horizon uh, missions. Yeah, I think that now uh, it's, uh, it's much, much clearer and uh, uh, it seems that the job has just started because uh, I have understood that uh, for the next at least uh, uh, five to ten years you are, you'll be very busy in, uh, in building something for sure. So uh, good luck and also congrats for what you're doing so far. And uh, yeah, maybe uh, you are already envisioning some uh, technical, technological spin-offs Uh, of uh, uh, of the project itself we have we have talked a little more general uh, so far but maybe you'd like to mention some of uh, of your own project yeah yeah absolutely you're right we i, I mentioned you know mining is a is a really good sort of secondary market from from space investment but um if you're not familiar with you know what an underground mine looks like you can imagine a very dark uh, generally rugged terrain environments that can have generally extreme temperature swings as you start to get deep in the earth it starts to get pretty hot um, there's no gps um, sometimes pretty poor uh, communications all of those things are true of the lunar south pole uh, so the technology like the autonomy systems um, that we're developing 
uh, for localization based on local terrain, um, the, the rugged and, uh, communication systems, the thermal management systems you have to have um, for, for space systems to deal with the extreme temperature swings. All of those technologies are directly applicable to mining equipment uh, and mining systems, particularly as we, you know, uh, get to harder to reach places um, when, when we're mining, um, you know, everything uh, in terms of technology nowadays is, is really reliant on these rare earth metals uh, that we have to mine for. Uh, uh, you know, I've seen some stats, your iPhone, let's say it's, it's something what, like 60 to 90 different materials or minerals that are present in that. And some of those are, are extremely rare and only found in, in, in really low concentrations. So we have to expand our mining operations to meet up with the, the growing demand of, of renewable energy technologies and um, uh, AI and all this sort of um, uh, server farms that are needed for all of that. <laughs> So by spinning again that, those specific technologies off, you can uh, enable that uh, for cheaper and, and uh, also remove humans from those environments. So that doesn't sound like a very conducive environment for humans to be in. So um, that's kind of the, the avenue that we're taking. And there's some avenues within the defense sector too, when you're in really remote locations, um, operating something, you know, in Australia, let's say in the middle of the outback, um, you want to be able to sort of control it remotely, uh, potentially from the other side of the world. Yeah, probably on, uh, as you said, on your side of the world, you are more used to this kind of situation here. Uh, uh, sometimes in, in Europe, you, we can only dream about such uh, desolated lands to be, <laughs> to be alone. <laughs> But yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that they are very valuable and, and again, practical examples of uh, mm. technological utilization for, uh, for future aspects, for sure. So, uh, ju ju in conclusion, I'd like to, uh, to let you talk a little more about your, uh, your vision of the future. And uh, I I've started dreaming uh, uh, inside this conversation uh, some minutes ago, so maybe you'd like to, uh, to tell us a little more about uh, your future vision. Yeah, uh, it's a good way to, to conclude. So I've kind of been talking about it throughout, but to, to say it you know, more, more plainly, it's there are infinite resources and energy in space. So I just kind of ask you to, to think about what would that look like on Earth if we were to able to access and utilize those infinite resources and energy. Um, you know, that longer term means the potential to move heavy industry off of Earth, to have all of our power generation, or most of it, um, off Earth, where um, Earth becomes just a sort of haven um, for living. And we don't have all of the large industry and, and um, pollutant emitting systems uh, and industries on Earth. Um, and that is really only enabled by these first couple steps of exploring the moon, starting to establish um, the ability to, to do ISRU um, and moon acting as sort of a, a Uh, staging place. It's much easier to get off the moon than it is Earth. So if you base operations off the moon out to these asteroids or, or even onto Mars, the cost of, of these efforts is, is drastically reduced. And then you can, again, use those materials to build these heavy industry sort of factories out in space um, where you're not within the atmosphere. That's essentially the key. Um, so it's, it's, it's all really for the betterment of, of Earth and, and humanity and its uh, future, I'm, I'm really excited to, to be pushing towards and uh, be a part of. Sure, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very happy about this vision and uh, uh, after this conversation I hope that everyone is, uh, is willing to, uh, to, to give his or her contribution to, to this cause because I, I think that uh, after today's conversation it's very clear that uh, that we need space and we need to keep exploring and also uh, get into the future. So I'd like to, uh, to thank you a lot, uh, Joseph, for being here today. Uh, it was a very enjoyable conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed chatting with you as well. It's always fun to talk about this.